And this year, uh, the governor of the state, Jim Gibbons, asked uh, the attorney general uh, to file a lawsuit along with, uh, turns out now, 19 other states that would challenge the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, aka health care reform. Uh, uh, our Attorney General declined to do that, saying a, a couple of things. One, that, that her analysis showed uh, that the law was constitutional, and also saying that as a member of, a, of the bar, it's her duty to avoid filing lawsuits where she doesn't have a good faith belief that there is merit at the heart of the, uh, of the lawsuit. Uh, that, that was a somewhat controversial decision. Uh, there is a state law that says the Attorney General shall file a suit when so directed by uh, the governor. So I guess the question uh, now would be, um, uh, are there circumstances in which the Attorney General can decline the order of the governor to file a lawsuit when the governor has determined that that uh, should lie? Mr. Barrett, will you go first on that? No. All right, we're going to get out of here way in time. <laughs> uh, obviously, uh, the Attorney General disagrees, so let's, let's uh, hear, talk, hear, talk about her reasoning in that case. Yeah, let, let, let me just, uh, uh, there's a whole body of law and, and case law that talks about the AG's office and the duties of an Attorney General, which is very unique. Um, not only are they the legal counsel for the executive branch, but they also represent state. They represent the people in the constituency um, by statute. Uh, I represent uh, on consumer protection issues, I rep represent businesses on uh, insurance fraud, workers' compensation, uh, and so uh, it's a dual role, um, and because it's independently elected, uh, I think there is that autonomy for the Attorney General, as the Attorney of the State, to ensure that if the State is getting, uh, looking at a, a lawsuit or litigation, that that engaging in that is not a frivolous action. Um, and engaging in it, uh, ensuring that there is merit to it, um, uh, and uh, and not playing into any potential political or emotional um, uh, issues that are out there surrounding this particular legal issue, uh, and that's for all of the AGs because of the unique nature of what we do. Um, that's how I felt in this particular case. Uh, I think the Attorney General, uh, and in my case, I. I had to look at this from a legal, purely legal perspective. Um, and and it, it was a number of issues that, uh, reasons why Steve said, but there was another one as well. Um, when I look at getting involved, the state getting involved in any type of issue, whether it's an amicus brief or litigation, whatever it is, I look at, is there state specific interest for Nevada that is unique, that we need to protect, that's unique from everybody else? Um, and then we look at the legal merits of it. Do we have the ability to succeed? Are we going to be wasting taxpayers' dollars and resources if we know ultimately the legal analysis at the end of the day shows that we are going to lose? Um, and so in, in this particular case, there are a couple of things. We, we, we did our thorough legal analysis. We Believe me, we reached out. We talked to people on both sides of it. Uh, and I... I I have some wonderful people in my office there that are incredible attorneys. I, I rely on their legal background and their analysis, and we sat down and looked at the legal analysis. At the end of the day, uh, with respect to the merits of this case, we felt that um, the uh, federal government has the ability to pass this law legally. Uh, now, with that said, knowing there were other states that were getting involved in this litigation, knowing that all of the state issues for those states were aligned. There was nothing unique that those states were arguing that we, wouldn't, would, that we would argue differently. Uh, I felt that there, again, it would have been a waste of resources for us to jump in and get involved in a litigation when we can very well let those other states play out the litigation and whatever outcome occurred with respect to those states, then all of the states would have, would, would have to live by. And so it was an issue of not only looking at the merits, but looking at the resources uh, and realizing um, uh, that the, in this particular case, it didn't matter where we, whether we were on or not. We didn't have anything unique to argue that those, uh, those states were arguing already. And so we, it was, it was a, just a, 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 that was the position that we took in the office and felt that um, that was the right position to take. And so, Mr. Mayor, let me follow up with you. The, the, you can think of no circumstance in which the governor would direct you to initiate litigation in which you uh, would would decline. Any any lawsuit that he told I you? I can't think of one. So, I'm saying it doesn't exist, but I can't think of one. 
So, uh, so, uh, of, uh, so there's no, there's no limits as far as you're, as you're concerned. He could, he could uh, uh, and tell you. Can you think of one? Uh, let's say he decided uh, that uh, that there was uh, a bill that uh, came up in the state legislature uh, that would uh, that would uh, reverse the, the, our current understanding with respect to the Fourteenth Amendment and uh, non-discrimination in public accommodations. Uh, the bill passes the legislature. Uh, it, there's a lawsuit filed against it. He orders you to stand behind that lawsuit, defend that lawsuit. You would do that? Well, if I understand your hypothetical, yes. If I understand. Mm -hmm. not, not on the merits of the 14th Amendment or, or whether that, but what is the duty of the office? The statute says when the governor directs. So there is a discretionary clause for the attorney general in the statute 228170. And in my reading, that discretionary clause is implicated in the absence of a directive from the governor. So I'm going to I'm going to bag out a little on the hypothetical because I think it's incomplete. But just in general, say I can't imagine a case where the attorney general has the authority to defy a direct from the governor. They may exist. And maybe I'm not that smart, but I can't think of it. Okay. Um, uh, <coughs> Ms. Master mentioned uh, litigation that, uh, that is involved in other states. We've had some examples where Nevada has joined uh, in on class actions, for example, the tobacco settlement uh, lawsuit. What criteria would you use? Uh, she has kind of uh, outlined some of the criteria that, that, that she goes through before uh, deciding whether to get involved in things like that. What criteria would you use to decide whether or not it's appropriate uh, for the state to join a class action, say for example, the tobacco settlement or perhaps the firearms, uh, lawsuits against firearms manufacturers? Well, for one thing, joiners are patently cheap operations. They don't require a lot of uh, work management or babysitting, so they're not terribly expensive. In addition, only the Supreme Court of the United States knows whether or not the edges of the Commerce <coughs> Clause include the provisions of Obamacare. And so the suit needed to be brought in order to establish that. And if you're familiar with the Commerce Clause litigation, Commerce Clause has been expanding uh, in a biological fashion over the last 30 years. But lately, the Supreme Court has become a little more hesitant to continue to extend the borders of the Commerce Clause and give Congress power over more and more of individual rights and liberties. And so we're right at the edge right now, I believe, of, of knowing what are going to be the steady contours of the Commerce Clause. And the only way we're going to know that is through litigation. And I think uh, whether or not you agree with the health care bill that was passed, commonly called Obamacare, it's a great test case to bring up and to test the edges of the Commerce Clause. Uh, and my view of Nevada is that we are a wonderful state. We're capable of running it ourselves. And we don't need an overreaching federal government taking or encroaching more and more of the rights uh, and privileges of the citizens of Nevada to run the state our own way. And so this. Uh, the, the, the Obamacare is a really good test case to find and determine the contours of the Commerce Clause. And so to me, the idea that it was going to lose automatically is a, a little bizarre. So let, let me just follow up on that. Um, uh, you know, there is more litigation on this issue than just uh, the Florida case. There are eight cases out there now uh, in about five or six different jurisdictions. Uh, we know West Virginia, uh, the judge uh, is still debating whether or not uh, to dismiss the case entirely. There's only one jurisdiction right now that has dismissed this case, and that is uh, in California. Um, I want to say it's the Southern District Court of California just recently in August dismissed uh, uh, plaintiff's action against the federal government uh, on this health care issue. Um, yes, it is going to be played out. Um, I think it will ultimately go up to the Supreme Court. Um, but there is no uh, harm to our state, in, uh, and nor was it necessary for us to jump on board uh, one way or the other when uh, it's being played out across the country.